Well, as you can see, I'm a little bit wobbly. So I, I need to explain that, I suppose. It's not as bad as it appears, I hope. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I got hit by what most people are describing as a COVID uh, kind of syndrome. I don't, I mean, I don't believe the official narrative on the COVID at all, but I got something that knocked me down and uh, I'm still coming up on it. So I'm a little short on breath. I understand we're at the 2200 foot elevation here. And in driving here from uh, Los Angeles area, we had to go over some 4,000 foot elevation points and I just about gagged out. I forgot to bring my little oxygen tank thinking, I'm not gonna need that where I'm going, a big mistake. So anyway, that's it. Now you understand, I'm, I hope my brain doesn't give out uh, as badly as my lungs are. Having said that, now let's move on. Um, I'm really delighted to see this audience here and I'm a little bit of frightened by what I've seen because I'm frightened by the highest level of awareness and understanding of what's really going on in the world of just about any group I've ever spoken to. And that's a scary thing for me because it reminds me when, when my bride, Pat, sitting over here in the corner, we were first married, we started having children like crazy. And these little kids were growing up and I had to tell them stories, bedtime stories, you know? And they'd gather on, Daddy, tell me some bedtime stories. I said, well, what do you want to hear? Well, I usually got the little Red Riding Hood or the Three Bears or something like that. So I'd start to tell the story. They, they know the story, right? They know it better than I did by that time. So that was the scary part. Because if I didn't remember every little detail in the story, they said, wait a minute, Dad, you left out the part about so-and-so. And so I discovered that these kids were getting too smart. I'd rather talk to them about something they didn't know anything about. So here I am trying to uh, save my face by telling you folks something you don't know. That's gonna be pretty hard to do. In fact, I decided that instead of telling you about things that maybe you don't know, I would rather tell you about things that I have learned myself along the way that I didn't know and the things that I've learned kind of recently that you might find interesting as an introspection of how it's all turning out. You know, I remember some years ago, I was watching some television program, a day program, and they were interviewing folks traveling to Chicago from all over the United States. And every time they'd say, who's the oldest person in the audience? And they'd find some, probably some little old grandma, she's from the Midwest, and, uh, They'd ask her, what's the greatest thing you ever learned or what's the most interesting thing? And I'll never forget this one time, they asked this lady, what's the, what's the best thing about getting old? And she said, well, Sonny, the greatest thing about getting old is you get to find out how it all turns out. <laughs> and I, I never forgot that because as I get older and older and older, I'm finding out how it all is turning out. And I thought I would share that a little bit with you today about what I've observed that's all turning out. And in an attempt to make it somewhat sound like it's organized, I decided to give it a, a theme. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I learned about money and power. Interesting topic in itself. Everybody talks about money and power, but do we really know what it is? So that's it. So here we go about money and power. When I was a young fellow, I didn't know anything about money except it was a good thing to have. And the more of it, the better off you were. And so you better, you better especially if you're a young fellow and you want to make a mark in the world, you better have a lot of it. So that was my whole understanding of money. And I knew that I had to earn it somehow. I, uh, so I, I became very studious in school. I thought I would get good grades. I'd learn a few things and maybe I could, I could be very competitive and I could rise, the, rise up the corporate ladder and make a lot of money, like a lot of young people did. And that's how I started off in life. And I'll skip over through all the unimportant stuff and uh, get to the real charge of the thing, which is I, I wound up, after having tried to go into the field of entertainment, I wanted to become another Cecil B. DeMille's, okay? 
I wanted to create the greatest movies that had ever been made. I was sort of in that field as a young fellow. I accidentally wound up as a child actor in Detroit, Michigan on radio. I learned about radio acting and all that stuff. Long story, kind of interesting, but not important. So when I went to school, I worked my way through college as a radio announcer at WUOM at the University of Michigan. So I was on this track. I was working in a television station when I got out of school, and then I went to the military and all that. So now it's the time to go to Hollywood and make my big splash. So it wound up being a big thud instead because I found out that there were a lot of people there who had much greater talent than mine, and they were washing dishes and washing cars and all that sort of thing, waiting for their big moment in Hollywood. So I decided by this time I had my beautiful wife, I had a couple of kids, it was time for me to get a job, a real J-O-B. So uh, I did, I got a job with a large corporation, a big insurance company, became an underwriter and was drafting and selling uh, group insurance programs to corporations for their employees and this customizing program, so forth. And I was on the ladder. I was on the corporate ladder. And um, the reason I mention it is because at that time, I was still very, very much wrapped up in how much money am I going to make? I've got to climb to the top. I'm going to get, get to be a vice president of this large corporation because all the, the middle management I looked <laughs> when I selected that company to go to work for, I noticed that the whole middle management and the top part all the old people there were, the people there in charge were old, I mean really old. I figured that they're all going to retire pretty soon. And when that happens, there's going to be a big management void. And if I would, in the middle of that void, I wouldn't have to be too smart or too great to be able to be sucked up into it. Maybe I'd get all the way up into one of those uh, good paying jobs. So that's how I was thinking. Not very, I'm not very proud of that stage in my life, but anyway, that's how it was. And then I discovered that uh, there were other things in the world. I discovered that I was being lied to by my government. I came across a little pamphlet on the United Nations, written by a college professor in the Midwest, forgotten his name, forgotten the college, but I remember the pamphlet. It was telling me that everything that I had learned in school about the United Nations was false, that it was not our last best hope for peace at all. And I was very incensed at that. And I decided to go do a little bit of research on my own. And I found out that the pamphlet was correct. And that was the beginning of my, my downfall, you might say. I was no longer interested in climbing the corporate ladder. I was interested in responding to my crusader gene. I didn't know I had one. And I suddenly became very, very concerned, crazy thought about the world, about the community, about the nation, about the future. Not how am I looking and how much money have I got, what kind of a car and all that. No, none of that sort of was important. It started to fade away and I quit my job at the company and so I could become a crusader. And Pat, she's been with me for 70 years now. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget, I was the biggest test. I, I was afraid I was going to lose her. She said, Ed, what are we, what are we, how are we going to put groceries on the table? I said, I don't know, we'll figure it out somehow. <laughs> and she's still stuck with me. So anyway, we did put groceries on the table somehow, and I went into business. And it's all downhill from there. As you all know, I started to produce very low-budget documentaries and so forth. And, and then finally, I got into these other deeper topics, and I came across the topic of international banking. I was going to produce a low-budget documentary on, on um, inflation. What was the cause of inflation? I wasn't quite sure myself. I just was pretty sure that it wasn't what everybody thought. You know, they were always pointing the finger at somebody else. Well, the farmers were making too much money. And the farmers said, no, we, we're going broke. We work hard. It's the truckers and, the, and so forth. And the, no, the labor unions. No, it's the grocery stores. I, everybody's pointing the finger at somebody else. And I had a feeling it had something to do with the government. But anyway, I was going to produce a documentary on that. I never did, but I did a lot of research. and I filled a couple of banker boxes with the research on it, all the books I could find that had been written on the topic up until that time, plus a lot of independent stuff. And I uh, never produced the film because I found out I was way in over my head. Here, a kid coming from school, wanted to produce movies in Hollywood, had all this glitter in his eyes about oh, how wonderful it was to be in Hollywood. 
to pick up on a story like banking and money. Why, there are people that get PhDs on that stuff. They're the ones that are supposed to write that stuff. But none of them were crusaders that I could figure out. And what I decided is that they needed a crusader in that field. So anyway, I found out I was in over my head that this is, I'm not the kid to do this. So I put the boxes away. And it was a couple of years later that some little old lady from Pasadena, you've all heard about those ladies? They're real. I ran into one real one. She, was, she had a car in her garage. I, don't, I think it was about 20 years old. It had about 200 miles on it, I think. And, uh, and in the beautiful little home, she was a widow, and she had this group, uh, study group on taxes. And she called me and asked me if I would, she'd heard that I'd been giving speeches on various topics, United Nations among them. And she said, we have a study group on taxes. Will you come and, uh, and deliver a talk to us on taxes? And I said, well, I don't know much about taxes, except that they're too high. And uh, I'm again them. What else can I say? Uh, I thought, aha, how would you like a speech on a hidden tax? A hidden tax? Oh, what's that? I said, well, if you want to know, you'll just have to, you'll have to engage me to come and give a speech. And then I'll tell you what the hidden tax is. Inflation, of course. So she said, well, that would be wonderful. And I pulled out my banker boxes. And this was about two or three years later, and I'm looking at all this research, and I was really delving into it and got pulled into it. I said, my gosh, this is bigger than I realized. So I started to get interested again, and I gave my little speech and so forth. I, I'm giving you too much of this personal background. I didn't intend that. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got sucked into the story of the Federal Reserve System. And uh, I started doing full-day seminars on... Um, a uh, crash course on money, what you must know to preserve your financial stability and your, and your safety for your retirement and all that sort of stuff. And it was very, very well received. We packed them in. It was a full day seminar. Uh, I never got to a group quite as big as this, but about half the size. I said, boy, this, we put this on the road. Until finally another little old lady, not from Pasadena, but from some little town I never heard of, came to me and she said, Mr. Griffin, I'm still in my 30s, and this is a little old lady, you know, could be my great-grandmother. She's calling me Mr. Griffin. I'm laughing in, inside on this one. I think, yes. Well, Mr. Griffin, uh, after what you've told us about inflation and, uh, and money, I don't know what to do. When my husband passed away, we had a little bit of money, and I, I invested it in some apartment uh, units, and uh, we don't have a lot of income, but I'm deeply in debt. Should I get out of debt? Should I buy silver and gold like you suggested? Or should I, what should I do? Should I get into debt? And inside me, I, I heard this voice say, Griffin, you're a fraud. You don't know the answers to her questions. And you're standing up there like an expert. And she thinks you really know. And I didn't know anything about that. I knew, how, I knew about the banks by this time. I knew how they worked and how they, how they plundered people legally through all the various devices they have. And uh, so I, I gave her some kind of a half-baked answer, and she seemed to be satisfied with it. It had something to do with diversifying your investments, you know, the usual stuff. And, uh, but I quit my seminars and enrolled in the College for Financial Planning so I could really learn about these markets, the real markets in the world. I never intended to become a financial planner. I never did. But I wanted to learn about the real markets so I could answer her questions and similar questions. And that's when I really discovered that everything that, that I learned as a financial planner was wrong because I already had knowledge about the monetary base and, and, the, and the underlying system. And they were teaching the professionals you know, how to invest in stocks and bonds and, and funds and mutual funds and all that sort of thing. Never would they ever talk about you know, assets, real assets like gold or silver or anything like that. It was just, how do, how do you support your brokers? And of course, all these financial planners became brokers. And I discovered, oh my gosh, this is, a, this is kind of a scam. And if you're not careful, you could sort of get dragged into it and believe the scam yourself. And that's when I decided, by golly, somebody's got to write a book on this. Not for how to support your broker and make him wealthy and lose money in the process and be wiped out by inflation when you're all done, but the real story. 
And that's when I started to write Creature. And that was a seven year project from that point forward. And by the time I came out the other side, I think, my God, I think I finally got it. <laughs> and I was learning all the way through. And that's the point, the real point that I started out to want to make is that I started to learn and the deeper I got into it, the more I realized I did not know. And that process, ladies and gentlemen, has continued to the very today, to the moment. It continued right up to my lunch engagement here with Patrick when we got to talking about Bitcoin. And we, I, I got him on one of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, hotspots and why I'm really not so hot on, uh, on cryptocurrencies, which are mislabeled, they're not crypto at all, but anyway, digital currencies, and it's because it has no intrinsic value. And we got into that thing and, uh, and he said a few things. I thought, hmm, I'm gonna have to go and reconsider this. So I'm still learning, you see, that's the point. And I'm glad that I'm able to do that. And if I change my mind, if I change my mind, uh, I'll be the first to say so. And, uh, but Patrick, you haven't told me yet. We have to continue to, continue to work on this. But there's nothing wrong with changing your mind and learning. If you don't change your mind, you never learn anything. So. That's that part, and I, it took longer to tell you that, but a lot of people want to know how I got into this racket, you know? So I just gave you the short version of how I progressed from the usual nothing to, I mean, the common newbies. I, I became a newbie, a normie, I guess is the word they're using now, and now I'm a weirdo, so here we go. <laughs> now, money, what did I learn about money? Well, the first thing is I learned that money has a bad rap. People say, oh, money is the root of all evil. I used to think that somewhat. I was embarrassed over the fact that I wanted to make a lot of money. But I sort of pushed that aside. I thought, well, maybe it is the root of all evil, but uh, maybe I can resist the evil because I want the money. All right. Then I discovered that money is not the root of all evil. Money can be used for evil, but it could also can be used for good. And in fact, most of the good things in the world need a lot of money. And if you don't believe that, and then you go to church, like most of us do, and somewhere along the line, they pass the hat, don't they? And the preacher might be saying, money is the root of all evil, but give us your money so we can have more of it. I thought, mm, something's wrong there. Uh, no, money is neither good nor evil. It's like all the other powerful things. It's, the evil comes with the minds and the thoughts and the intentions of those who spend the money. How are they spending the money? If they're using the money for evil purposes, of course, then it's not a good thing. But most of the good, if not all of the good projects that we've seen in the world, the uplifting of mankind, the improvement of education, art, the sciences, knowledge, travel, charity, all these good things take a lot of money. And so we need that. The question is, what is money? One of the most interesting things I learned is that in the research phase, I came across one of the most prestigious uh, international seminars on money. And I had the, the, uh, the minutes of the meeting and the discussion points and everything. And here were the heads of governments and the uh, heads of governments and the, and the heads of the various treasuries of those governments. And the, the very people and institutions that were creating the money in the various nations of the world were meeting at an international summit and they could not agree with each other as to what money was. They argued over what money was. And the, the debate still goes on today. Already I've heard several things mentioned that, well, maybe money is this and maybe it's that and so forth. Does anybody really know what money is? Well, the answer is yes, I found out. It's not, not so complicated. It's in the dictionaries, they have different ways of describing it, but money is merely a medium of exchange. That's all it is. It's, it's something you take, not because you want it in itself, but you take it because you know everybody else will take it, and then you can exchange it finally for something you want. Or you can just keep it as a storehouse of value for the day when you figure out what it is that you want and you just have your savings. So you need something to put savings into because you can then convert it into something else. So it's different from barter. It has to go through an intermediary stage, but that's money, that's all it is, a medium of exchange. And so that means a lot of things can become money and most things have at some point or another. I mean, in prison, cigarettes are money. And in World War II, if, if you were in a, a GI and you were overseas and you had cigarettes, you could exchange it for just about anything in any country you went to and so forth. And, there were times when, well, you, I don't have to go into that. You all know this. So 
money, uh, I became a little more interested in money as a, as a means of doing good at some point. And so I wanted to figure out what is good money and what's the difference between good money and bad money. And now, here again, you folks know the difference between good money and bad money. And so I don't need to go into that. Because if I didn't get it quite right, you'd probably explain it to me that I made a mistake. And I know I'm too embarrassed to do that. So I'll just skip over trying to bore you with uh, the definitions of good money versus bad money. But we all know instinct instinctively what good money is. It's that good money, really good money, is something that everybody wants and can exchange for goods and services. And uh, it's, uh, it can be yours. And this is the critical thing in our day today, uh, in our understanding of money today, is it your money or not? I don't know if you realize this or not, but it used to be when you put money into a bank, it was your money. It was a deposit, it's called a deposit. You deposited money, meaning it's your money. And there are two kinds of deposits, the time deposit and the, and the demand deposit. And most people have demand deposits where you put your money into the bank. The bank says, yes, we'll guard your money, it's your money. And if you want it back, you can demand it anytime you want, and we've got to give it back to you. And uh, they classified most of it as demand money, but none of it was demand money, really, because they would immediately invest it and, and multiply it and, and be in debt far beyond the ability to pay you back. And then when you came in and did demand it, if more than 3% of you did it all at once, then the bank collapses and run on the bank. Now, there was a, there is a, and still is a, a classification called time deposits where you agree when you put your money in the bank that they may take up to six months or nine months to pay you back because it's an acknowledgement in advance that they are investing it. But most deposits are demand, used to be demand deposits and so forth. And so that was a lie. It was a, one of the big, uh, biggest lies in the banking system. But now, I don't know if you know this, but it's not your money anymore. The laws were passed and no, it received very little coverage in the press. When you put money into the bank, they say, thank you very much for investing in our bank. You have now become an investor, like buying stock in, in General Motors. You have invested in the bank. It is not your money anymore. And they can do whatever they please to do with it, and you cannot do anything about it. And the, the day is coming when you're gonna, if you didn't know that already, you will be informed like I was recently, I have several small businesses with little checking accounts in them, and I, I spent more money than I usually do in one of those little businesses, and I got a notice from the bank saying, we cannot honor this check right now because you have exceeded your 30-day limit in my own checking account. And of course, I knew why, but I didn't think they would actually reveal their hand to me. And they, they, I got official notice in the your Official limit was exceeded, therefore we're not going to honor this check. Okay, so a quality of good money is it's your money. If it's not your money, like I saw in the chart here earlier, there, one of the, I guess it was listed as an advantage for crypto, was that it's programmable. No, that's, to me, in my m mind at least, programmable money is not good money because that means they can say, they can program it. it meaning that you can't have it. Like they programmed my money, or what oh, I used to think was my money. I had exceeded my 30-day limit. It was programmed. I don't think that's a good, good thing to do. Okay, so money, what can you say about money? We are going to, we've already in the process right now of losing our money. It's not our money anymore when we put it in the banks. But at least at the present time, we have an option. We don't have to put it in the banks. There are a lot of other places we can put it, like in crypto, for example. Well, we can put it in real estate, we can put it in inventory, stockpiles, whatever we want to. Uh, we can put it in gold and silver, how about that? And then uh, we've escaped the system. But now, we're coming into an era, as most of you folks know, where there's even that trap door is going to be closed and sealed because the money will not even exist outside the digital world and it'll be completely owned and programmed and administered by the banks, the central banks of the world. And that's what all the talk is about on central bank digital currencies. And that's programmable digital money. And uh, you may think you have a certain account 
value. They might say, well, according to our records today, you are the proud possessor of, uh, they won't call them dollars anymore, they'll just call them units or something. Doesn't make any difference what they call them, they're units. Let's say you have 50,000 units in your account today. Congratulations. Now, you have to spend half of that by the end of the month, or then you lose it. Well, oh, so that forces you out and you have to spend it. And so it's in circulation, that makes the economy look good. And if you don't spend it, you lose it. Now, if you spend it in the wrong place, oh, you're in deeper trouble. You spent this on a, on a type of, a, of an expenditure that we do not approve. This is antisocial. Uh, this is, uh, you're a, a domestic terrorist when you do this. You're voting for the wrong person. You, are, you need to be punished. We can't allow you to destroy our beautiful, wonderful system by spending these units that way. So we are going to punish you and cut your allotted amount of spendable units this month. Now you can get them back next month if you promise to be good, but if you don't, uh, we're gonna punish you some more. And if you keep this up, we're gonna be like the people in China where they, can't even, they don't even have the units to spend on the apartment where, they, where they're allowed to sleep. They don't have units to buy the food. And they can't even go on the street with a tin cup asking for donations because nobody has anything to put into the tin cup. It's all digital. That's the world we're moving into, ladies and gentlemen. You all know that. Everybody's shaking their heads. Say, I'm telling you things that you already know. So this was a huge awakening to me a few years ago when I realized that's where we were headed. I wondered what this digital craze was all about. Now I know exactly what it's all about. I, I for one, I still am a little bit suspicious about the origin of uh, Bitcoin. I'm, all the good things that have been said about Bitcoin, I have to admit, uh, I agree with. But I'm just wondering if maybe this... Nakamoto or whatever his name is, uh, maybe it was the CIA or something like that. And it was ma mainly some way to get people all excited and enthusiastic over something which in the long run was going to be something that would use, be used to control us. So uh, those, those are things, uh, my observation, let's see, what else? There was something else I wanted to get into. Oh yes, the main thing. Um, how much time do I have, uh, Patrick, left? No, not all the time, I would. Maybe, maybe 20 minutes? Would that be 20 minutes? Or are we out and out? I, I have a feeling that what I'm seeing from the crowd is you have all the time you'd like. So, well. um, <laughs> is, that a good, is that a good enough answer? Okay. Okay. You'll be sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't have enough steam power to go too long. But... Um, it had to do with ideas. We talked about money and power. And so I want to talk about the power part right now. We've been talking about money. And these are things that I'm sure you all know so much on this. Uh, but the, the power part might be a little bit uh, myst mystical to you. It was to me. The power part. Money and power is a phrase we hear all the time. This person is interested only in money and power. Well, when you analyze it, I believe you'll find there's only one thing. There's no, it's not money and power. It's power. And the only reason money has any value is because of the power it bestows upon the individual who holds the money. The power to call for and, and command the services and products of others. That's really what we're talking about. How do you... How do you uh, access the services and products of other people. And up until now, in our era today, that's always been mostly through money. They're changing the nature of money as we've been discussing just momentarily here, so that it's not going to function that way anymore. It's being phased out to pure, pure power over access to products and services without having to be money at all. It's, they're going direct is the way they phrase it in the banking system. You'll hear that word more and more, going direct. And that simply means through the social credit system that they're designing to replace this, the money system, it's not really gonna be a money system, it's gonna be a control me mechanism. They will be able to access and command your goods and services directly, and you have no place else to go, no place else to go. And 
Okay, so that we're back to money again, but the interesting thing is how are they going to do this? They have to sell the idea, first of all. And the American people and the people all around the world are buying into it. Why? It's because of an idea. The idea makes it seem like it's a good thing. Now, here's where this area, I think, needs to be more carefully examined by everybody. The importance of ideas. I think it was probably about the time of the French Revolution with liberté, you know, uh, equality, and all the slogans for, for democracy. The idea that the average person should have control over his own political destiny in some way. And that means, in, up until now, it has meant elections. We vote for our dictators. <laughs> uh, elections, we, we get to vote for people, therefore we are the source of the power. Okay, that was a very appealing idea up until then, didn't have much traction. But with the invention of the printing press, and especially with later with the invention of electronics, which allowed a guy like Adolf Hitler to stand up there in Germany with a microphone with amplifiers all around this huge area, even bigger than Caesar's palace. <laughs> <laughs> and the people all lined up by hundreds of thousands, and they're all getting this message from one man, immediate, right now, real time. And the power of, of creating mass illusions and delusions and emotions through communications was just in this infancy. And from that day forward, warfare became changed. No longer was it just a, a question of who has the most guns and bombs or bayonets or soldiers through physical force. But the idea of capturing a population without having to fight became an intriguing idea and quite possible with the advent of, of technology. And so it was possible for FDR to sit there with a microphone and say, my friends, you know, he talked to the we 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 just been in, We've just been invaded by a powerful enemy, and this is, uh, you know, so forth. And, oh, we're going to have a banking holiday, and I love Fala. Uh, Eleanor loves Fala. Everybody loves Fala. We all hate war, and all this stuff. And this gets broadcast to millions and millions and millions of people at once. And, okay, the, the point, you, you got it by now, is that that changed civilization, it changed warfare. Warfare now became approximately at that period of maybe 100, 150 years different in that now it was important to conquer the minds of people, not their bodies. If you can conquer their minds and get them to believe that their conquest is for their own good or for the good of society, you win big because now you don't even, they don't resent you, they still respect you. You, they're conqueror. They still, they go to you and, and applaud you. And you, you can see that when you, those old newsreels when they, when Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and others and are dr being driven through the crowds of the streets in a big convertible and they're up like this, you know, like that. And people are throwing flowers and cheering and, and women weeping out of love and compassion for their great leader. And this is their tormentor, you know. This is their tormentor. This is their... This is the dictator that was their wildest nightmare a decade or two previously. So how is that possible? It was because their minds had been, been conquered. Okay, that's the point. I want to talk to you about power, real power, the power of thought, the power of ideas. And we have been conquered, ladies and gentlemen. This is my observation. When I say we, I mean the peoples of the world. We're conquered by an idea. I call it idea X for the moment. It was launched along about the time of the French Revolution and incubated for the 150 years in that period. And it spread the world, through around the world. It conquered the world. Everybody accepted it. You accepted it. I accepted it. In school, it was taught to me. It was never described as, a, as an ideology. It was just an idea that we all accepted. Idea X was the idea 
that we, has a name. It's called collectivism. If you're not familiar with the use of that name, please become familiar with it. We are in a battle ever since this time, worldwide, between two ideological forces. One is collectivism and the opposite is individualism. And all these other words, communism, fascism, Nazism, socialism, progressivism, I don't care what you come up, there must be hundreds of names. Now we have neoconservatism, we got neo this, neo Nazism. Those words are meaningless. They are meant to be meaningless so that you and I can debate over the relative merits or demerits of them and we get totally confused because if you, if you really understand what they are when you look underneath them, you'll find that all of them on the side of the tyranny, on the tyrannical side, are the same. Now, some of you may have heard me talk about this before, but I have to tell you, the rest of you, it's very important because this is perhaps the most important thing that ever happened in my life, in my journey of understanding and learning as I go. And that is when, when I quit my job at the big insurance company, I was concerned over, like everybody else, over the rise of communism, right? Communism had taken Russia, it had taken China, it had taken Cuba, it was at our doorstep. We saw communists in the streets in America. By gosh, if we don't get serious about communism, 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 was something is, we might fall to communism someday. So I was in that position at that time. We've got to alert people to the dangers of communism in America. And I was curious about this thing called communism. So I thought, I, don't, I need to find out what, what motivates these people. Because I could see that every time communism came to power, it was chaos. It was death and destruction or mass murders and people were, people were suffering and it wasn't utopia at all. And yet all these people were out there chanting and, and moving around demanding communism or socialism. So I said, I want to find out what this is. So I, I went down to the communist bookstore in Los Angeles on Larchmont Street. I'll never forget it. I think it's still there. It's called the People's Bookshop. And I started to hang out with the comrades. And they were very suspicious of me because I'm a young guy with a tie and you know I got a suit on, a business suit. I'm in the business world, right? And they, they didn't know what to make of me. And most of those guys were a little bit hippie in their, in their attire and everything. And uh, anyway, they thought eventually that I was a potential recruit because they invited me to their they called them the study groups, but I knew they were recruiting funnels. So I started to attend those, and I bought up all their books. And to their amazement, I think, I read them. <laughs> I found out that a lot of those guys there had never read the books they sell. Because I would ask them questions. I'd say, oh, where's this? And they didn't have any idea. And I, I found out the difference between Marxism and Marxism-Leninism and all that kind of stuff. Well, since I have unlimited time, I'll tell you the difference between Marxism and Marxism-Leninism. <laughs> give you an idea how deep this can go. Marxists, in their literature, in their literature, not in, not in our minds, they have their own vocabulary. In their literature, a Marxist is a person who has read the works of, of Karl Marx, you know, Communist Manifesto, um, Capitalist Manifesto, I mean, Communist Manifesto, and, and uh, uh, das Kapital, yeah. And uh, they believed in the principles of socialism. Okay, that's a Marxist. Then you look at all the countries in the world that have fallen to communism, and you've come up with the most amazing thing. None of them were ever taken over by communists. They were taken over by a group of people called the Marxist-Leninists. So what is that? Well, a Marxist-Leninist is a person who's read all the works of, of um, Karl Marx, and he's on board. He's a Marxist, all right. But he's also read the works of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who was very, very prolific. They had the uh, collected works of Lenin, I think, were four or five volumes, big, thick volumes. And it's, it's, it's very troublesome to read through because it's repetitious, repetitious. All of it boils down to basically one thing, and that is, comrades, it makes no difference what you think or what you how good a debater you are, the only one important thing, and that is to come to power. Once you come to power, you can use any means to come to power. Once you come to power, if anybody disagrees with you, 
you win the debate automatically because you can shoot them. You are in power. That's Lenin. And all of his works more or less point in that direction. Lenin was the founder of the, of the Communist Party. Lenin turned communism into a method of warfare and conquest. Forget the ideology. Lenin said the ideology is for show. What really counts is the power to control the lives of the people. And so I got it. Uh, communism was, according to the communists themselves, had never been achieved in any of the countries at the time and still haven't. The communists in the bookstore knew enough to say, that's right, Russia is not a communist country. Because right in the works that they were selling, it explained it very carefully. Khrushchev was a, a, a very uh, advocate exponent on that one. He said that, he said, what we're creating is socialism. Socialism, socialism is the first stage. First, you must condition the minds of the people, the minds of the people, to accept the principles of socialism. Once socialism is in place, then we can create communism by eliminating all of the non-socialists. <laughs> now we have communism then. In the future, communism is something that's never been achieved. It's always in the future when you eliminate all of the socialists. And of course, before that, you have to eliminate all the non-socialists as well, and so forth. Anyway, this, these are the things I learned. and what. The reason I'm telling you this is because many people probably in this room have not learned it yet. And that is that when you compare the, the ideologies of communism, and I did, I started to make a list of them. I, they believe in this, 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 this. Made a list of them. And then I thought, oh, I wonder what Adolf Hitler would have to say about this. And I, I got a copy of Mein Kampf, and I read that and started to make a list of all the things he believed in, and you know what? They were exactly the same. Remember, Nazism, Nazi stands for National Socialist Party, right? Nazis were socialists. Socialists are Nazis. They're fascists. Fascists are Nazis. Communists are socialists. I mean, the, all of these words that we use to distinguish all the tyrants that we're supposed to oppose, they believe in the same thing, and it's collectivism. That's my point. Unless you understand that our enemy is not communism, socialism, fascism, Nazism, and all these things. It's collectivism. And we have people in America in high positions who are anti-communists, anti-socialists, and they'll lie about being pro for the Constitution. They lie, they lie, they lie, because they're Leninists. And Lenin said, comrades, you can lie. You must lie in order to come to power. And if you find somebody who tells you the things that you want them to hear, there is a very good chance in our world today they're telling you that because they're trying to get into your mind. They want you to believe in them as their leader so they can lead you to death and destruction. That's what I learned. Now, okay, thank you. And I, I think I'm going to close on this theme because that's the main thing right now that's occupying my, my life. I'm trying to codify things like that into, uh, into a, a project which we call uh, the Red Pill Project. And we're putting on Red Pill Expos and, and we have a thing called Red Pill University and we're right now building campuses of Red Pill University. We want at least one campus in every county in the United States. You cannot build a movement from the top down. You cannot say, who are we going to get in the White House? No. No. By the time you see who's running for the White House, I mean, it's all over. We've got to be the ones that select the candidates, not to pick the candidates that have been selected for us. So anyway, we've had to build the movement from the bottom up, not from the top down. And it has to be about power. Money is still important. My gosh, that's how they, they're still acquiring power today through money. But we're on the brink, on the tipping point, where they won't need money anymore. They'll just have raw, direct, going direct power over your lives every aspect of your lives and the money won't even matter. It will be like living in a uh, military world. I don't know how many people have been in the military. I was in for a little bit. But it all goes by rank. If you've got stars on your collar or, or, or emblem on your cap or stripes on your shoulder, you have rank in that system. And it's, you get everything you need. You have health care, you have food, shelter, clothing, 
everything you need, entertainment. But if you step out of line, you're in the brig or against the wall. That's the kind of a world they want us to live in. Money is not going to be that important anymore. It still is. I'm not saying to give up your money. <laughs> no, you still need it. But spend it, ladies and gentlemen, spend it, spend it now to waken up your fellow Americans as to where we're headed because the time will come where the money won't mean a damn thing. It's just our freedom and our liberty and our food, yes. Those are the things we'll be struggling for. And this all starts with the idea of collectivism versus individualism. Uh, I have prepared a booklet and I hope everybody will want to order a free copy of it. I'm gonna give you the, where you can get it, download it. I meant to bring it and show it to you how beautiful it was, but I forgot to pack it in my briefcase. But it's, it's these are the, uh, probably uh, 50 pages, about 50 pages from my next book. Notice how optimistic I am, my next book. I've been working on this for a long time and I thought, well, why wait? I mean, I might not be around to see it the book actually finished, but here's the core of the idea. Let's get that out now. So just about three weeks or four weeks ago, I pulled it together and put all of these ses sessions about uh, collectivism versus individualism into one booklet, and I call it The Chasm. You know, The Chasm is the great divide between collectivism and individualism, the issue behind all issues. Everything we do, everything we worry about in our world today, we find that the people on one side are collectivists, and on the other side, like us, we're the individualists. We have to bring those words back into the vocabulary. We have to understand what they mean. If we understand the details that are outlined in this 50-page brochure, we finally, finally have them. We have the ammunition. We have the understanding. We have the ability to defeat them. But as long as we use their words and, and fall to their tricks, they're, they're capturing our minds. They're, they're convincing us that, that these shots and injections are for our own good and to save your grandmother. And they'll, they'll get us to submit to something that no tyrant could do with guns and bayonets, but they do it by getting to your mind and convincing you it's, it's the right thing to do. It's for the betterment of society. It's, uh, uh, and everything, everything you can think of that you don't like, everything, I guarantee you, you understand that the ideology behind it to make it seem acceptable comes under the heading of collectivism. That the group is more important than the individual and that the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. That's the enemy and I'm delighted to share my thoughts with you. Let's get together and defeat that enemy and thanks for listening. Wait, 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 Mr. Griffin. Look at that. Well, I don't know. What do you think? I think good. Yeah. Will, will you guys give him a second? Because he told you about this awesome book, but you didn't tell him where to get it. Oh, oh. See, oh, I do that all the time. It's okay. I got your back. Got me back, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, it's chasm, spelled C-H-A-S-M, chasm dot realityzone dot com. Thank you. That's it. Chasm.realityzone.com. Guys, one more time, Mr. Griffin. Right, thank you. Thank you so much. Coming down the stage.